Hey there, fellow gardeners. Are you wondering what to plant in your garden this May? Well, stick around because I'm gonna share with you what vegetables you can start, all the exciting projects I have planned for this month, along with one special tip that will help you get the most out of your garden in the month of May. Plus, I have a surprise giveaway that you won't wanna miss, so make sure to stay to the end. So let's get started and make this the best gardening season yet. I'm Petrina with Homegrown Florida and we're going to start with what vegetables you can plant this month. We still have about a month and a half till summer officially starts, but for us here in Florida, it is hot. <laughs> and I don't mean like, wow, looks like we're getting some good sun today. I'm talking about slowly melting, <laughs> like you walked into a sauna where you constantly sweat, your hair frizzes from the humidity within about five minutes of being outside and getting third degree burns every time you try to touch your steering wheel. You know, Florida summer hot. <laughs> If it's that miserable for us, I'm guessing our plants are gonna have a pretty tough time too. We'll really wanna start focusing on plants that can handle this kind of weather. In fact, we want the ones that thrive in this heat. These are no wimpy plants. These guys are tough. Things like amaranth, which is a great alternative green to grow during the summer, and it also produces a grain. Chayote is a vining, perennial squash, kind of like a summer squash, which is more perennial for folks either in Central or South Florida. Cowpeas grow like weeds here, and those are black-eyed peas if you're not familiar. Lufa is a really fun thing to grow, and I'm actually contemplating whether I'm gonna grow it this year or not, but lufa can be used as a zucchini substitute when it's small or young, or you can let it grow to maturity and dry on the plant and create sponges from it. Okra is another really cool vegetable that you can grow during the summer and it is needed in our gumbos and jambalayas. Papaya is a perennial in South and Central Florida and it is a fruit that is so yummy. Peanuts, peanuts guys, we can grow peanuts and make our own peanut butter. How cool is that? Pigeon peas is one that you may not have heard of before. It is a perennial pea, but it seems more like a bean. Pineapple, our second fruit on the list. The first time I saw a pineapple plant I, with a pineapple growing on it, I really thought someone was messing with me because it really was not what I expected. One of my favorite fruits is roselle. I have planted eight this year and every single year I grow more and more. My first year was like one or two, then I did five last year. Now I'm going up to eight because I feel like I never have enough. Don't forget your sweet potatoes. They are one of the easiest summer plants to grow for a huge yield. In fact, you probably can grow a full year's supply during our summer months. Swiss chard is a green that seems never ending in my vegetable garden. This green has been uh, perennial when I don't think it's supposed to be perennial, but they stand up to the heat, they stand up to the cold. It has been doing great. If you're not a fan of Swiss chard, maybe you wanna try something like a tropical spinach. There's a bunch of different kinds. Malbar, Okinawa, Perpetual, Longevity, New England, Ethiopian kale, Sisio, lots of options out there. Try them out, see which ones you like. And the last vegetable is tropical squashes like Seminole pumpkins and Tahitian melon squashes among several others that do well during the summer. But don't forget the flowers too. Guys, you can grow zinnias, marigolds, cosmos, salvia, and of course, our one and only favorite summer flower, sunflowers. Now let's jump right into the projects I have for this month. Because we're heating up, I'll be increasing my watering schedule and my mulching. Right now, I've been watering twice a week for about 15 minutes, and I'm going to be moving that to three times a week for 30 minutes. 
but be very careful when you start increasing your watering schedule so that you don't overwater your plants. Your best bet is adding an extra day of watering first, then slowly increase the time by five minutes. On the night before your next watering, stick your finger down into the soil to about your second knuckle, maybe even deeper, the full finger, and see if there's any moisture deep down. If the top of the soil is dry and the soil deep down has some slight moisture, you have reached the perfect schedule. If it's completely bone dry and the plant leaves are starting to wilt, in the evening especially, um, upping that timing of watering or adding that extra day is going to help. Don't be so concerned with your plants wilting during the day. Lots of different plants like cucumbers and squashes appear wilty during the heat of the day, like right at noon. And then if you come out at night and take a look at them, they might look perfectly normal. They'll perk right up. They're just responding to the heat. They still have good moisture. Something else you should be doing to help retain moisture in your soil is mulching. For the first several years of my gardening journey, I didn't mulch my beds or containers. <laughs> I guess I just liked the way it looked. I thought it looked like neat, but I always had trouble keeping the moisture in my soil and my soil always seemed to just get more and more unhealthy. No matter how much compost I added, it just dried up and turned to dust. No worms, no bugs, bad germination rates, my soil will become hydrophobic where the water would just hold on top rather than soaking down below. So I started mulching my strawberries first because honestly it was just to keep the bugs from eating them. <laughs> I had read that if you add mulch to strawberries you can keep bugs um, separated from the strawberries um, and the dirt would keep those bugs away. So I added this thin shredded pine mulch. I think I got it from Rural King. I noticed that the soil stayed dark underneath and I didn't have to water as much. So I started laying that stuff down all over my beds. But that can get pricey. <laughs> so I wanted to try to find free things to mulch with. I rake my leaves in my yard. I use my grass clippings from my weekly you know, lawn mowing. And I chip up my own branches with my Sun Joe chipper. Guys, it was a game changer. And it seems the more I add, the healthier the soil became and how easily it held even small amounts of water. I'm not even exaggerating. I add four to five inches of mulch during late spring all the way to early fall. And it breaks down so quickly. So I just keep heaping it on over and over all season long. The only time I slow down is in winter <laughs> because it almost becomes a little too good at holding moisture. <laughs> the downside, I have to use gloves now when I dig in my beds because the amount of bugs and worms popping up all the time, <laughs> it, it kind of grosses me out. Like I'm trying to be comfortable around bugs, but when a worm kind of pops out the soil and falls on your hand, it just little icks. <laughs> I love my worm friends. Um, I want them to have a happy, healthy home, but I'm not a big fan of them kind of jumping up out of the soil and onto me. My next big project for this month is to keep my tomatoes pruned. I've been doing the Florida weave method, and if you haven't seen that video, I'll put it down in the description below. And so far it's been working out pretty well for me. Some of my uh, posts, particularly the really skinny green posts that I'm using are starting to lean but I'm hoping that they will hold up long enough to get to the harvest. <laughs> Next year, I will definitely use something like my one inch bamboo, which is not leaning at all, or you know, move to T-posts. So far, so good. But one area I have not been keeping up with is my pruning. <laughs> In the past, I've tried letting my plants go wild. I've tried doing the single stem method with uh, tons of pruning, but I pretty much landed on a hybrid where I prune a lot in the beginning, especially the bottom, but then I let them leaf out at the top. I also don't single stem them anymore. I feel like it just produces more in the long run, but that could just be my experience. Yours might be different. By doing this hybrid approach, usually it keeps the blight down for the first couple months. Eventually they do succumb to blight, but this is much further in the season when the pests pretty much tear them apart anyway, and the heat stops allowing the blooms to pollinate. So for me, it's, it's the time to pull them out anyway. 
The last project I'm going to be doing is bringing my house plants out to my covered patio for about a week to let them get some good sunlight. House plants are not going to want to sit in full direct sun. These are plants that do well with lots and lots of shade and ambient temperatures, so like 70 degrees, like what we leave our houses. So I don't want to keep them out here very long. I'm just going to do a week on this table here. Another reason why I'm keeping it in my screened in patio besides the shade it's going to get is trying to keep it bug free. <laughs> The screen keeps a lot of bugs out of this area, so there is less chance bugs could infest this plant once I end up bringing it back inside. I'm not a big houseplant gardener, so I'm definitely not an expert, but I have done some research uh, that letting them hang outside every once in a while may extend their life. If you don't have an area that's covered or screened in, another idea is to set them in a really sunny windowsill for a week. Maybe even during a time when temperatures are cool enough that you can open your windows and let some fresh air into your house. So now we've come to the part of the video where we are gonna get into our special tip and seed giveaway. That special tip is all around staying cool while gardening in the summer. I know summer gardening can be pretty tough and I do everything in my power to spend as little time as possible out here, but I do get out into the garden several times a week just to check on things and do small tasks. You wanna make sure you're doing your best to stay healthy in this intense heat. So here are some of my tricks. First off, garden early or late. So this is before 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m. This is when the sun is not as intense. I call this chasing the shade. I only work in the areas of my garden that are shaded during the time that I'm out there. I skip working in the areas that have direct sun at that particular moment. Now this next one's gonna sound a little crazy, but I night garden. <laughs> Once the sun has set, I put on my headlamp and I get to work. The bugs can be a little intense, especially with kind of a light you're flashing around at night, but it's a better trade-off than burning up during the day. Although my go-to approach is what I call my 15 garden, one chill. Basically, I spend 15 minutes doing an outside task. Then I go back inside the house and do some housework or just relax for an hour in the AC. It does make everything take a lot longer. <laughs> you always wanna make sure you're well hydrated when you're working outside, lots of water, and have a small snack or meal before you get started. The sun can really drain you quickly, so you want some energy and hydration. Another tool in my summer gardening tool belt is a wet cloth or fan mister. You probably are used to seeing these at amusement parks during the summer. Great little gadgets. I just turn it on, set it beside me, and spritz it every once in a while. Keeps me nice and cool. Also, wear light clothes. Put the jeans away and hop into some shorts and a tank top or grab a nice flowy skirt or dress. And if you're really adventurous, May 6th is World Naked Gardening Day. Make sure to wear some sunscreen, guys. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh. Even with all these little tricks, I know summer gardening isn't for everyone. So I wanna challenge you to try at least one of the heat-loving plants this summer, but I want you to neglect it. Direct seed them, water them in a bit until they germinate and start growing. Then once the summer rains start, ignore them. <laughs> don't treat them for pests, don't trellis, don't fertilize, let them go wild. I'll be doing the same. And I'll add pictures on Instagram and Facebook with the hashtag, hashtag Florida Summer Garden. So you guys can see my progress. I hope you'll join me and do the same. It will be a fun little experiment. It's possible that some might die, but you didn't put much effort into them, so it's not a huge loss. But I'm gonna guess that you will experience what I experienced, and that is some will thrive. With a little luck and a lot of neglect, we'll be harvesting some cool tropical veggies before you know it. If you're gonna join me in this challenge, head down into the comments and leave me a note. And now for the giveaway. Last month, I had three lucky winners who got the Thai soldier bean seeds, and congratulations to Ashley, Ant, and David. This month, I'll be giving away Everglade tomato seeds from my own personal collection. I know it probably seems a little late in season to be growing tomatoes, but Everglades are a special variety that will not only grow in the heat, they will also flower in high temperatures. If you get them started now, they will start growing through the hottest part of the summer and continue into fall with a little luck. 
I strongly encourage you to give these guys some shade. Even though they don't mind the heat, you will see them do their best with an afternoon reprieve from the intense sun. Another good idea will be to succession plant them. More than likely, your first plant will survive for a long time, but in case you get early blight or a cutworm comes through and snips the seedling in half, you have more to take its place. All you have to do is head down to the comments and leave me a note on why you would be excited to win these seeds. One week after the video airs, I'll pick three people who commented on the video to send seeds to. If you are one of my three winners, I'll respond to your comment, letting you know you won, and then we can connect and I'll send you a small packet from my own seed collection. Everglade tomatoes are started just like any other tomato. You start them in a tray and you pot them up as they grow. The one caveat here is I have found Everglade tomatoes to be tough to germinate and have much longer times to germinate. So be patient. You can transplant them super young, but I usually like to wait until they're about a foot tall just to be sure that they can stand on their own. You can grow them in beds or containers, but be aware they have a lot of branching. If you like, you can use a tomato cage or a trellis, but I found that these little powerhouse produce so many tiny tomatoes that I just let them run wherever they want. Be prepared that if you let a few of them ripen fully and drop into your bed or container, they will reseed themselves like crazy. In fact, this is my favorite way to start them because they are a little finicky with germination. These are great little tomatoes for snacking in a salad. And one of my favorite ways is to toss them in some pasta with some garlic and olive oil. And don't forget that TikTok viral trend for feta and tomato pasta bake. These are perfect for that recipe. If you wanna watch a couple more of my videos, I'll pop them up right here and here. You can check those out between now and my next upload. Happy gardening, guys.